Okay, let's go for it. I, 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 I want to um, say uh, thank you all for being here. This is a joint meeting between House Healthcare, uh, led by Representative Lippert, Senate Health and Welfare, led by myself, Senator Lyons, and uh, our committee members are all present. Today, we're taking up an issue, I think, of interest to both committees um, on diversity within the COVID-19 response and trying to understand what's going on in Vermont, the data that we're collecting and so on. Um, before I begin, I'm gonna ask Senator Ingram just to say a couple of words. This was an issue that she has been very interested in having our committee work on. I know Representative Lippert, I want you to go first and then Senator uh, Ingram because I know it's a, an issue of interest to both of our committees. So uh, Bill, why don't you uh, start out and then we'll go to uh, Debbie. Uh, th thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, yes, our committee has expressed uh, interest in, this, in the issues of diversity and equity within the COVID-19 response, particularly around issues of race, uh, but also uh, access for persons with disabilities and I believe today we'll primarily, um, perhaps not exclusively, but primarily focus around issues of race and the importance of uh, understanding the disproportionate impact that's happening uh, across the country and what we in Vermont need to do in order to both understand and uh, address issues here in the state as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses. I understand we have a representative from the Department of Health uh, who will be listening and responding. Uh, hopefully we'll hear what their response has been. Uh, there's certainly been some issues in the media. Uh, but with that, I'd be happy to turn it over to Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, yes, I really appreciate the uh, both committees taking an in this. And we've seen um, in the news that in other parts of the country, uh, they have data to uh, demonstrate that um, uh, the uh, number of people of color, especially um, black people who are affected by COVID-19 um, is uh, as much as, as double uh, the, their representation in the general population. And um, um, whenever we have that kind of inequity um, in other parts of the country, I think you know, Vermont needs to be aware that we are not immune to, um, uh, to such inequities. Um, sometimes our challenge is not always, ha is not having the data um, that we that we need, but we should be, I think, very intentional about uh, getting that data and be very sensitive to uh, the inequities um, that exist. And um, so, I'm very glad that we're examining this issue and hope that we can come up with some um, some solutions uh, going forward. Okay, thank you, thank you both. I think everyone on on both of our committees could give a. Uh, a speech uh, or provide information about our interest in this area. So uh, I think that uh, before we uh, before we go ahead, I would like to ask um, Nelly, are you there? Uh, th the question I have for you: Are there other folks uh, interested in testifying who are not on our agenda? Uh, I haven't had anyone else email. No. Okay. I, I know uh, that we had suggested, uh, I guess Amanda is here from. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. We're all set then. Yeah. Um, I just have to find my agenda. Apologize briefly. Want to make sure we go in order. Um, so Susanna Davis, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome. I don't know that you have been in uh, Senate Health and Welfare previously. Have you? Tested? No, not yet. Okay. And, um, and I don't, have you been before House Health Care? No. Not yet. No, not yet. Well, so, so, so welcome to you, to both well, our committees. Welcome to both our committees. And rather than go around the entire screen and introduce ourselves, uh, we'll do that as we uh, might ask questions. So, uh, we're very happy to hear your testimony on uh, equity issues, diversity issues related to COVID-19. So why don't you introduce yourself for the record and we will listen to your testimony. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Susana Davis, Racial Equity Director, State of Vermont Agency of Administration. All right, so today my testimony will be a bit longer than it tends to be when I visit the legislature. Evidently, there's a whole lot to say on this topic, and I do invite um, my friends from the health department to chime in if they uh, notice me making a factually incorrect statement. This is something that we want to get right. And of course, I invite any of you uh, senators and representatives to interrupt me as needed with questions, comments, complaints, concerns, corrections. First, I will tell you a little bit about my role and my stake in this. Then I'll talk about some national trends that we're seeing. I'll follow up with a little bit about Vermont specific information. And then I will end speaking about upstream factors, social determinants of health that contribute to these issues. And I will leave you with a couple of key parting thoughts. So uh, as you know, I am your racial equity director and the enabling statute that created my role that was act nine of 2018 requires me to do well a number of things, but uh, two of them are one, identifying systemic racism in Vermont state government and two, overseeing the statewide collection of race data. Needless to say, this topic falls squarely within that mandate. And I wanna give a note on structural racism. I haven't done my spiel yet to either of your committees. So you haven't heard me say this in this context, but I wanna make a note about structural racism. When we talk about identifying structural racism in state government, structural racism doesn't mean intentional racism. It doesn't assume ill will. It refers to systems that create racially disparate outcomes. And this is important. Because a lot of times when we talk about racial equity or systemic racism, it triggers a defensiveness in folks and they take it as an accusation and end up ignoring the underlying substantive issue. So when we talk about systemic racism, that doesn't assume ill will. And I want folks to be part of this discussion, to be present in this discussion from a place of solutions, not a place of accusation. Before this job, I was uh, at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I think my world would look a lot different right now if I were still there. Uh, while I was at the health department, our major focus was health in all policies and health equity in all policies. So a lot of my previous work was in the health sphere and it centered around understanding the relationship between upstream factors and health outcomes, which I'll cover later. So I'd like to move into discussing some of the national trends that we're seeing. I won't go into specific population numbers because I think some of your other witnesses will cover those, but the general trend is that areas that are reporting race data related to COVID-19 are showing that people of color, specifically African-Americans, are disproportionately represented in COVID-19 cases. In addition to African-Americans, tribal nations are also suffering disproportionately through COVID-19. Some examples of that include the strain on the sovereign to sovereign relationship that has been caused by certain state level restrictions. Uh, the multi-generational housing that's very common in a lot of our indigenous uh, households around the country has created challenges with social distancing. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Economic impact, for example, a lot of our indigenous folks in the United States have uh, rely heavily on the tourism industry, particularly around casinos. That has suffered tremendously and that rep rep represents a huge economic foundation for that community. And lastly, things like clean water for hand washing are not always present in some tribal lands. And I'll get, I'll get to that again a little bit later also. I'd like to talk about also why this information is important. When we talk about reporting race data related to COVID-19, it's often seen as an afterthought or a subset of data. Truth be told, the data are critical information and are necessary for us to have real time analysis, not just sort of be pieced together after the fact, because it allows us to do more than just analyze a loss of life after the fact. It actually allows us to mitigate harm, to avoid the loss of life, on the front end. And we've seen this before, right? In related to COVID-19, for example, at the outset of the pandemic, it was believed that COVID-19 was less fatal for younger populations. And a lot of younger adults around the world took that as license to continue congregating and to neglect detailed hygiene practices. 
but it was the real time tracking of young people contracting and dying from COVID-19 that prompted a global shift in attitudes of young people who then began taking this more seriously. That saved a lot of lives. And it was a no brainer. It's a no brainer that we would wanna do this for all populations. Now, Vermont is a special and unique and wonderful place, but it is still in America. And as Senator Ingram stated earlier, Vermont is not immune, pardon the pun, to the issues that Americans confront. So let's talk a little bit about Vermont data. And I'm, I'm gonna tease this a little bit by stopping first. I wanna tell you first about the mechanics of the way that we're collecting these data before I give you the actual numbers. So how and when are these data collected? They're collected at the point, and when I say these data, I'm talking about race and ethnic, race and ethnicity data related to COVID-19 cases. These data are collected at the point of patient contact. So they're primarily collected by the providers. Another opportunity that we have to collect race and ethnicity data is when the Department of Health's EPI team, the, the contact tracing team, follows up with COVID positive patients. So a patient um, interacts with a provider, they get a test. If the patient tests positive, there is follow up from the state. Uh, and so those are two opportunities that we have to collect race data. Now on the collection rates, the form that's used at the point of COVID-19 screening is a form that's created by the CDC and it contains a section that asks about ethnicity and it contains a section that asks about race. Until recently, providers in Vermont were only filling in that information 27% of the time. So three quarters were not completing race and ethnic data. This means that the data that I'm about to share with you are massive underestimations. And actually, I need to repeat that because I don't want you or anyone else who's listening to latch onto these numbers and draw conclusions from them. The data on race and ethnicity for Vermont's COVID-19 cases is distorted due to underreporting. Now, what are we doing about that? Because of this, the VDH, the Vermont Department of Health has since issued guidance to providers and to the contact tracing team to ensure that this information is being collected going forward. So our data will improve in the, current, in the coming weeks related to race and ethnicity, but it will remain incomplete until we revisit the previous missing data and fill it in. And that, that step is key. Filling in the missing data from before is just as important as collecting the data from this point forward because the data we're collecting now appear to reflect a downward trend of cases overall in Vermont. But some of the most critical data are those from the initial outbreak, which are really invaluable when we talk about vulnerability and preparation for future statewide emergencies. So I don't want anyone to think that filling in previous data that we didn't have isn't as important as collecting data going forward. I would say it's equally as important. And that's a step that I'll talk a little bit about later. So. Per the information that I have, I'm gonna give you racial distribution and ethnic distribution for uh, COVID-19 cases in Vermont. I want to note for you that we don't have race information. I'll start with race. We don't have race information for 59% of, of these cases. Now I know a few minutes ago, a few moments ago, I just said that we were collecting at a rate of 27%, which means 73% was missing. And now I'm telling you 59% is missing. That's because since we've issued that guidance to providers and to the contact tracing team, that data has been coming in. And so now the missing data represents a smaller share of the overall data. Does that make sense to everyone? I'll just take nods. Okay. So we have, I thought, no, no, that's right. Okay. So we don't have race data for 59% of cases. Here is the data we have. For cases reported through April 13th, which was Monday, we had 310 cases of COVID-19 in Vermont that did report race and 440 that did not. Of those that did report race, which again is, is what is that, 41%. Of those that did report race, here are the counts. American Indian or Alaska Native, there was one case. Asian, there were five cases. Black or African American, there were five cases. White, there were 299 cases. Here are the percentages into which those translate. 
that one case for American Indian or Alaska Native translates to 0.3%. That five, those five cases of Asian Vermonters or Asian people in Vermont translate to 1.6% of the total who reported race. The five cases among Black or African Americans translates to 1.6% as well. And the 299 cases of white folks who tested positive for Vermont whose files included race data account for 96.5% of those cases. Let's move on to ethnicity. For ethnicity, we do not have ethnicity information for 62% of those cases. Here is what we have. 285 cases contained ethnicity data, 465 did not. Of those that did, those who, report, those who were listed as Hispanic accounted for four cases or 1.4%. Those who identify who were identified as non-Hispanic accounted for 281 cases, which is 98.6%. I do wanna remind the members of the committee and members of the public that race and ethnicity can and often do overlap. So the four Hispanic cases or the 281 non-Hispanic cases are not mutually exclusive of the race categories of Black, Asian, White, or American Indian, Alaska Native. I'll stop there because I know that was a lot of numbers. I will stop to see if anyone has questions. Um, I, I do have a question. So the data that you're talking about, can we find this um, on the Department of uh, Health website or some other um, location where it's consolidated? Yes, uh, I am not 100% sure. I should have checked before this hearing, I apologize. Um, if it is not already on the portal, it will soon be on the portal. And if you don't mind, Madam Chair, uh, I can get to that a little in a little bit more detail in a moment. Okay, I, uh, I see that there's a friend, uh, David Englander of the Department of Health, who is willing to reach out. Well, I, would it be all right with you if we call on David at this point? For oh, please. Yeah, good, okay. Welcome, David. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is David Englander. I'm the Senior Policy and Legal Advisor to the Commissioner of Health. I'm grateful to be before the committee and we'll talk a little bit later. Um, so the, the, the EPI summary data, um, I've now sent to Nelly and is now posted on your website. That's a daily update um, that we Department of Health is now including um, all this information um, on a daily basis. It will also be by the end of the week on our, um, we have a dashboard a publicly available dashboard and that by Friday will be available um, to the public and updated every day. Okay, thank you. Terrific. So that'll, that's good. And we have that now. You've sent that into our web pages. Thank you. And, and Nelly has been good enough to post it already. Good. All right. Um, thank other, you, <laughs> it's nice to have a friend. Oh, I appreciate the assist. Yes. <laughs> Are there questions from uh, the committees? I see Senator Ingram. I see Representative Smith. Oh, so we'll start with Senator Ingram and then we'll go to Brian Smith. Thank you. Um, so um, Susani, um, you mentioned that um, uh, going back, sort of going back in time to get, collect the race data uh, from earlier when you know it was not uh, being collected uh, would be important that 73% of time times wasn't collected is how is that possible how 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 can we how can we do that based on my conversations with health department leadership it is it is an undertaking but it is largely possible so some background on that is that and, and this will go into some of the caveats that I'm going to issue momentarily. But so a lot of times the information is perceived, not self-reported. So if at the point of patient contact, the provider has not included this information, one step that we could take is to find out if it's already included in the patient's medical file. If that information does appear elsewhere in the patient's medical record, then that could help us to fill it in. 
However, if it's not, then again, another opportunity that we might have is if our epi team, our contact tracing team initiates or, or maintains contact with the patient and can fill that information in at a later date. One of the challenges with that is capacity, of course, right? I mean, the health department, the epi team are doing monumentally much more work than I think any of us could have anticipated uh, they would end up having to do this spring, this winter. So being able to do that is, it's, it's time consuming. I don't pretend that it isn't, but it is possible, I think. We just have to be diligent, I think, and, uh, and, and be insistent with our providers on, on making sure that everybody understands the importance of gathering that information. Thank you. Okay, Representative Smith. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Director. Uh, Good morning. The, the percentages that you just explained a moment ago, aren't they the same percentages of what the population of Vermont is? Thank you for pointing that out, Representative. So right now, the numbers <clears throat> appear to track closely with Vermont's racial and ethnic demographic population. However, and this is a big however, we are, this is with the understanding that our data are limited. We're only talking about 59, or rather 41% and 30 something percent uh, respectively for race and for ethnicity. So if the full numbers keep pace with the numbers we do have, then yes, it would appear that we are equitably distributed just in terms of our statewide population numbers. And that would indicate not no disparity, or at least not the same kind of disparity that we're seeing in other parts of the country. If the full, so I'm, I'm just gonna repeat that. If we had all the race data for all the cases and they kept pace with the numbers we have seen so far, it would track closely with population numbers and that would be within an, within an acceptable margin of who we would expect to see in our case breakdown. Right. However, Thanks. because of the limitations of, of our data, we only have a portion of it. Thank you very much. I think that's what makes Vermont such a great state. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Representative Derby and then uh, Representative Lippert. Yes, thank you. And good morning, Susanna. I, just following up on the um, Representative Smith's question, I'm wondering, do, do we know, do you know um, anything about when data is underreported this way, whether we can say anything statistically about the likelihood of, of uh, the pattern continuing to hold or not. Yeah, is that, am I, make, am I asking that in a way that makes sense? I, I think I understand the question and I appreciate it because this gets at one of, this gets at, at one of the challenges that came up in my discussions with VDH leadership. Um, you know, I'm not a data scientist. Uh, I act, I, I didn't wear shoes today to make sure that if I had to count above, above 10, I could use my fingers and toes. That's a joke. I'm wearing shoes, but, uh, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a numbers person, which is why I rely very heavily on those who are people who work in health departments, people who are in the sciences and in healthcare, we have to trust when they report data to us that they understand the mechanics of those numbers. And so one of the things that I discussed with BDH leadership was the challenge of, or the question of whether it's responsible to report incomplete data. You don't want the public who may not be as well-versed in statistical analysis to draw conclusions from a limited data set. So if I think, if I'm understanding your question correctly, then what's really important, and I will get to this later, What's really important is not just that we have the data, but that we report it in a way that is responsible and that communicates to the public that it is limited, that we can't draw firm conclusions, but we can at least start tracking patterns, which is absolutely better than not seeing it at all out of fear of misinterpretation. In other words, I would rather see an incomplete data set with a lot of asterisks and caveats than not see a data set at all out of fear that folks might not understand it. I hope I've answered your question. Let me know if I haven't. Okay. Uh, Representative Durfee, you're, are you frozen? I think you are. Uh, we'll move on to Representative Lippert 
and then uh, Representative Cordes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do want to add, I'm only halfway through my testimony, so I'm- That's I'm okay. <laughs> okay. We're, we, can, we can go to 12 o'clock. I do, we do have several other folks uh, in line. Excellent. So okay. um, we'll, we'll take two more questions then we'll listen to the rest of your testimony and try to move on to the other folks who are here with us. So thank you. Uh, so let, let, me, let me underscore the importance of completing the data uh, that has been talked about. Uh, I've had a great deal of experience previous in my previous roles, chair of the Judiciary Committee in trying to establish roadside, race, roadside stop race data and having incomplete data completely distorts uh, the situation. And until and unless we have complete data, we really do not know what we have in front of us. And so um, this, this it's, it, it does take work to go back and complete this data, but fortunately this has been addressed uh, at this point. And I think it's imperative that the data set be completed. Okay. Uh... Representative Cordes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Director Davis. Um, and I, I have a feeling you're going to, Director Davis, you're going to get into this, but I just wanted to highlight what I think one of the most uh, critical um, uses of accurate data or one of the most destructive uses of inaccurate data is that um, it impacts the resources provided to specific communities. And um, that re is essential when we're talking about um, preventing the spread of um, contagious diseases like COVID-19. Um, when we could be doing more to uh, help um, communities that uh, have congregate, congregate housing like our migrant workers, um, and also impacts access to resources. Um, again, access to, access to housing, access to um, healthcare, and then once within the healthcare system, um, how implicit bias impacts um, how those people are treated. Um, so again, I imagine you're gonna get into that, but I just wanted to highlight um, that's why we want data. Uh, thank you for that. And so we'll, um, I think that under, underpins a lot of the concerns that are, are out there. And I will we'll move back to Susanna and let you move on with your testimony. So I know you had mentioned something about social determinants and I think uh, that representative Cor Cordes was moving into that. Yes. Area. So Go ahead. Thank you. So I've just given you some, number, some numbers and I need to give you some caveats to go with those numbers. Mm -hmm. First, the race inputs from the form are often perceived not self-reported. And I have to say, just for good practice, I stress to you that when the, whether we're talking about traffic stops, CDC screening forms, school enrollment, it is monumentally better to have people self-report their ethnicity or their race rather than to assume it on their behalf. For example, I would always be miscategorized because phenotypically folks assume that I am black American. And so it's really important to let people self-identify. Also the mixed race population in Vermont is projected to more than double by 2050. So it's going to get increasingly difficult to guess a person's ethnicity. And frankly, it's a bit presumptuous to do so. So I always recommend in all contexts, let people speak on their own behalf. That is to, so all of that is to say that the race and ethnicity data that we do have, not only does it represent a small percentage of the total COVID-19 cases, but we're also assuming that people were accurate in their uh, categorizations. Next, what we know only comes from what's reported. That is to say, the numbers could be higher. We have people who have contracted and unfortunately died from COVID-19 who were in their homes who were not tested, who were not tracked, who didn't die in hospitals. So the numbers could be a lot higher, especially when we talk about marginalized populations. Of course, the numbers could possibly also be lower. There have been some questions at the global level raised about the difference between dying of COVID-19 versus dying with COVID-19. However, one thing that I do wanna highlight here is that what we think we know about race and ethnicity with COVID-19 cases 
We know that because of the collection practices, it is an undercount, but because of the unknown unknowns, it could also be an additional undercount for that reason. Next, there's the question of the size of the data sets because of potentially identifiable information. As you know, HIPAA and other regulations uh, govern health privacy. So there is a difference between what we want to share and what we legally can share. That said, it's critical that we do everything that we can to share as much as possible while remaining in compliance with applicable laws. And last, I just wanna say that we're not drawing conclusions yet and we're not assuming that there is a disparity. We're really talking about getting the data in the first place to see if disparities exist, right? So it's not that we're, we're not looking for problems, we're looking to head off a problem before it turns into a more tragic problem. Now, I wanna talk about the work we're doing in Vermont going forward. I am extremely pleased and grateful to the VDH for all of the expertise and the support that they've provided, helping walk me through numbers and helping me understand the technical aspects of the COVID-19 response at the clinical level. Public posting, race data, as David just shared, will now appear on the VDH COVID-19 public dashboard, and it's gonna be updated daily along with the other demographic information on that dashboard. And I have to say this, the responsibility for presenting those data doesn't just rest entirely with VDH. Our friends in journalism, our friends in data analysis and other professions bear a great responsibility to report these data in a way that accurately reflects its limitations. For example, helping their audiences understand the impact that a 27% reporting rate can have on a data set. It also requires that all of those other partners provide the appropriate context for the re responsible interpretation of data uh, to avoid misleading the public in a way that I'm about to discuss momentarily. So I wanna zoom out a little bit. We've talked about some national trends and I, I'm confident that your other witnesses will get into more detail about what some of those other trends are. We've talked about the Vermont specific numbers and about what VDH and my office are doing jointly to ensure that these data are governed and protected better going forward. Now I wanna zoom out a little bit and talk about the systemic factors that have helped get us to this point. You may hear quick takes about why people of color are more susceptible to COVID-19. And a lot of those quick takes are bad takes. As a general rule of thumb, please do not trust anyone who in the face of a systemic problem prioritizes an individual response. And I'm gonna deviate a little bit from my normally calm demeanor and get a bit agit. Here's a, this is a planned outburst, if you will. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. I am not yelling at you, I am yelling through you. No amount of downstream shaming is going to mitigate the upstream factors that prime certain communities for harm. This concludes the planned outburst. Recently, the US Surgeon General Jerome Adams made some comments at one of Washington's daily press briefings and those comments have done more harm than good. I would like to address those comments and help you understand the underlying factors that lead to the myths that unfortunately he has spread. He mentioned that he spoke to Hispanic leaders and African-American leaders. I was curious not to have heard him mention Asian or indigenous partners in this discussion. As we know, nationally, there was a very sharp anti-Asian sentiment um, with the initial spread of this pandemic. This is something that we've seen even here in Vermont. I've spoken with our friends at the Vermont State Police who have informed me that there have been incidents of bias related to COVID-19 against member, Asian members of, the, of Asian Vermonters. He also acknowledged that Hispanic people represent a majority of COVID-19 deaths. What he did not mention is that many Hispanic people may not even be presenting for testing or treatment due to the chilling effect that's caused by inconsistent messaging around immigration enforcement. Therefore, the numbers of Hispanic people could likely be very much higher. He also stated that it's, quote, alarming but not surprising that people of color have a greater burden of chronic conditions. This is code for it's to be expected. And why exactly is it to be expected? 
African American and Native American people, he says, have more high blood pressure and get it at younger ages, and that Puerto Ricans have asthma at higher rates, and that Black boys die of asthma at three times the rate that white boys do. He does not acknowledge that people of color are often priced or redlined out of more well-resourced neighborhoods that bear the lower brunt of ecological harm, that they're more likely to live in counties with higher rates of PPM 2.5, that's fine particulate matter, which contributes to higher asthma rates, or that, the, that neighborhoods that are majority people of color are more likely to have food deserts and food swamps. And I'm sorry, I'm going back to my health department days. I have to define for you a food swamp, which is an area where unhealthy food options vastly outnumber healthy food options. The metric they use is four to one. So food deserts and food swamps tend to be located in majority minority neighborhoods, which often uh, has a direct correlation to higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, childhood obesity in these underserved neighborhoods. This is a result of strategic disinvestment, historical lending discrimination, and other factors that corral certain people into well-resourced areas and others into under-resourced areas. The Surgeon General also said that the chronic burden of medical ills and social ills make people of color less resilient to COVID-19. And what are the social ills that he mentions? He says that people of color are more likely to live in dense housing, which poses a challenge to social distancing. He fails to mention that this is often not by choice. Ask any recent college graduate if they want to have five roommates. He also says that teleworking is not common among the African-American and Latino communities. He fails to mention that employment discrimination, disparate educational opportunity, not to mention the exorbitant cost of higher ed, means that African-American and Latino people are less likely to get jobs that lend themselves to teleworking. He also says that many Navajo Nation members lack clean water for hand washing. He fails to mention that indigenous nations in our country have had to constantly fight to protect land rights and work against ecological harm that leads to unclean water supplies. He says to us, and this is a direct quote, you are not helpless. He tells us to adhere to task force guidelines and to avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. He says, quote, we need you to step up. As far as I've seen, and I haven't seen uh, and I haven't seen the Surgeon General who is who does identify as African American. I haven't seen him give any health briefings related to COVID-19. So I won't publicly comment on why he was brought out to do this particular comment on people of color. But I will say that as far as I've seen, admonitions about alcohol and drug use have not been part of the public health guidance issued at the federal, state, or local broadcasts that I've been watching. It's curious why it's mentioned here. Additionally, it's really hard for some folks to feel comfortable following the task force guidelines, such as wearing a mask in public, when we see in certain jurisdictions, for example, Illinois, that there are reports of African American people being followed and even removed from stores by police and told to remove their masks because it makes them look suspicious. And we've seen this before during emergencies in the United States. I draw your attention to Hurricane Katrina, where some folks of color in New Orleans were described as looters, while others were described as finding food and supplies. And oftentimes that hinged on what they looked like. I'd also like to discuss, and I should have mentioned this a few minutes ago, but the importance of language access and inclusive messaging in public health emergencies. And an example that I frequently use is the example of Flint, Michigan. When the residents of Flint, Michigan were alerted to the fact that their water had been poisoned, the Spanish speaking or rather the limited English proficient community in Flint was exposed to poisoned water for weeks longer than white residents simply because the city had not been doing enough outreach in Spanish. Something that basic contributed to monumentally bad health impacts for minority populations. So that our leaders would purport to write off the enhanced vulnerability of a quarter of the country as the product of our residential and employment and substance use patterns is a cop-out. And Vermont is not a cop-out state. If we were, we wouldn't be having this hearing. So it's not enough that we simply know within ourselves that people like the Surgeon General and the interns who write his speeches are wrong on the facts. We must also actively counter these persistent and harmful myths. So please, tell a friend. I will leave you now with just a few parting 
thoughts. I thank you for your indulgence as I've taken up nearly an hour of your time. One, assessing systemic inequity is a critical part of protecting the most vulnerable. This is not optional. Two, I've been having similar conversations around the COVID-19 response and its impact on people of color in Vermont in other contexts, in criminal justice and corrections, in economic development, around minority and women-owned business enterprises and in other sectors. Across the board, I'm finding that data regarding people of color in Vermont as it relates to COVID-19 are not being brought to light widely and are not even being queried in some cases. So this is really a broader issue. This is highlighting bigger patterns of practice here. Next, if we acknowledge that there's urgency brought on by COVID-19 for dominant groups or for privileged folks, then there's an exponential urgency for people who are marginalized or underrepresented. And this includes people living with disabilities, the LGBTQIA community, people experiencing socioeconomic hardship and others. I wanna remind you, don't look away because the problem that we ignore becomes the problem that's much bigger to deal with later. And last, I wanna uh, remind us not to let small numbers dissuade investigation and not just in health, but in any context, because concern for privacy or the bandwidth of staff, they end up rendering us invisible entirely. And I have to say this, I'm channeling our state, our state librarian, Jason Broughton. This is especially important when we think about the 2020 census, which is right now delayed and really hampered by COVID-19 as, and the census is also, this is the first year that they're gonna be using an anonymizing algorithm. I'll let you investigate that on your own time, but effectively that algorithm uh, threatens to erase small communities in rural states entirely. So that makes it especially important that we accurately collect our own data in contexts like these, because the ability to keep our own stats and cross check our data sets against a redesigned and interrupted census is gonna be really key. That's all we're gonna have for the next decade. And last, I want to think in terms of community empowerment, I want to think about, I want us to think not just about data collection and information collection, but also about information exchange. And VDH has done a wonderful job of keeping the public informed, not just during COVID, but in general. That's its general practice. And this is how we build community trust. It's not just about going to communities and saying, I need all your data, and then not coming back with anything. That's not how you build community trust. So I encourage all of us that when we think about this, think of it as a two-way street. Think of it not only as collecting information for our own use, but also providing information. And again, I think VDH always, in other contexts besides COVID-19, does a very good job of engaging community in that way. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Uh, Susanna, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been extremely valuable for everyone. I think it's highly objective and, um, and, and, and useful, not just during COVID-19, but going forward. So thank you for that. Um, I see that Ann Donahue had her hand up a long time ago. Ann, are you still, Representative Donahue, are you still with us? Not well. If she comes back, we might we might go back to you with a question. Any other uh, quick questions? Because we are uh, we do have other folks. We're good. I think this is the beginning of a longer conversation. Thank you for being with us. And I think Senator McCormick had his hand up. Senator McCormick had his hand up. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susanna, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I appreciate it. W how would we get the data that's that's lacking? Just just uh, just having a, a, a race or ethnicity question uh, on every intake or what, what do you suggest we do to get better data? So with respect to COVID-19, the screening form that's being used is designed by the CDC and it does already have an input field for ethnicity and an input field for race. The trouble was, I don't think that the trouble was whether there was space for it on the form. The trouble was that a lot of folks at the provider level, at the point of first patient contact, 
did not consider that to be part of the basic information that was necessary. And for some, you know, to some extent, you can understand they're all strapped, they're doing a million intakes, and they figure we're just going to do what is absolutely minimally necessary. And so what I'm, what I'm here saying is that race and ethnicity is minimally necessary. And so VDH has issued guidance both to providers and to the members of their contact tracing team to that effect, um, telling them that race and ethnicity data is mandatory data that needs to be collected going forward. So it is our hope and our belief that the data will be more complete going forward. And then with respect to going back to recapture the missing data that we didn't previously get, I do think that that's a task that uh, our, our EPI team will likely have to undertake in partnership with the providers themselves. So I, I don't pretend that it's not gonna be labor intensive or time intensive, but it's incredibly important for a lot of reasons. Thanks. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I'm suggest that we move on. Uh, we have three additional folks to testify and we have the Department of Health, David Englander here as, as backup. Uh, and we will try to get to you, David, as well at, at, the, end of the, at the end of the other testimony. Um, let's see how we do. Uh, Tabitha Paul Moore is here from, the, from Rutland, president of the NAACP, so welcome. Uh, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for the committee and then we'll listen to your testimony. Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Susana, that was phenomenal. And I was able to take out a lot of what I was going to say. So hopefully that'll save us on time. So I am the president of the Rutland area branch of the NAACP. I'm here today speaking not only as president of the NAACP, but also as the Vermont director of the NAACP. And so what that means is that I'm testifying not just on behalf of Vermont's branches, but also on behalf of the New England Area Conference of the NAACP, uh, which is the next level of administration um, for our organization. And for those who are not familiar with the NAACP, we are the nation's largest and oldest nonpartisan civil rights organization. And we have more than half a million uh, members. So I'm representing a lot of folks coming here today. Nationally, we've issued guidance, the NAACP has issued guidance to states about racial and ethnic disparities, um, as well as some uh, suggestions for ways to go about um, dealing with or addressing those. Um, that guidance came out um, early in the beginning um, of, the, um, of the federal response to the pandemic. So I can provide that information for you in writing if you'd like that um, as well. On a state level, myself and my colleague, Stefan Gillum, who's president of the Wyndham area or Wyndham County branch, sent letters to the Department of Health, as well as to healthcare providers and to people of color regarding COVID-19 and how we could do better as a state related to data collection. That is encouraging people of color to come forward and um, request that it be documented until the Department of Health comes out with um, a guidance beyond that initial document. Um, and that is a very difficult ask for us. I don't know if, if you're familiar with uh, people of color in our history with uh, the US welfare or, um, health systems, but it's not great. So this is a huge ask to ask people to self-disclose um, racial and ethnic uh, demographic information, but it is something that we're doing because we think that given that Vermont is so late to the game in terms of collecting this data, we need a multifaceted approach. So we sent it to the Department of Health we sent one to people of color, and we also sent a letter directly to healthcare providers. And again, I'll send that to Nelly, or I can try to put it in the chat so folks can see um, what and why we're doing that, um, rather than explain it all here today. But I think uh, I, I think uh, send it to Nelly, and okay. it'll go up on our web pages. Great, I'll do that. Um, but like I said, at this point, we see that it is critical that everybody is starting to ask or, or uh, provide this information so that Vermont can get a better picture of what's happening now. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Davis provided a very, th very thorough review of the demographic breakdown of race and ethnic data nationally and statewide. And as she noted, the data is extremely limited and incomplete. And it's important um, to remember that we don't know who's reporting the information. She did mention that um, there's a huge difference between self-report and uh, provider um, assumption. For example, in my own life, you might look at my son and see that he looks like a, your average white kid. 
Um, what that means as far as his healthcare provision is that folks are not gonna ask him questions, for example, related to sickle cell, which is a trait common in African-American communities. So it's not only um, just not good form not to ask, it can actually have a pretty devastating consequences when people do not ask us this information. Um, and 27%, we know that that's, you know, we don't want to do anything based on 27%. And so those of us that have been advocating for the release, the public release of the information, we are grateful for what has been able to be, be cobbled together at this point. But we also know that an incomplete data set can be dangerous in the wrong hands. Um, and it's really difficult to, um, you know, pat ourselves on the back for the fact that right now it looks like um, it is going along Vermont's racial demographic breakout. Um, the COVID-19 um, uh, data collection. So we wanna make sure that folks are extra cautious not to assume that that trend will continue as we get better with data collection. Uh, we know that the Department of Health is dedicated to patient-centered care. At this point, it's not a matter of um, whether they're going to collect the data. We know that the Department of Health sees this as, as um, important um, to do. So what I wanna focus on is what we wanna know. And so what we wanna know is not just the state level breakdown, but also the county level breakdown. And the reason, and within that, we wanna know who's getting tested, who's infected, who recovers and who's dying. Because at every level um, of the system, at every point in the system, we need to understand where the disparities may or may not happen. And again, we're not saying that it's automatically happening that way in Vermont, but um, we're scared just like everybody else. And we deserve to know. And um, in developing the response, the Department of Health um, can be more targeted in what they do um, by having that information. Likewise, for us, for people um, who are doing the work of racial justice or just people of color in general, um, it's helpful for us to have this so that we can do targeted out outreach. As Ms. Davis mentioned, um, the levels of infection in Hispanic communities tend to be even higher, Black and Hispanic communities. So if we're looking at it by county in Vermont, and we know that there's a high concentration of Hispanic um, folks in one area, but it looks like the, um, there's an underreporting based on trends and data, those of us who are um, racial justice advocates can then go out to those communities and find out, hey, what's going on in a way that the Department of Health cannot because of our relationships and the type of work that we do. So this data isn't just helpful for the Department of Health in the response, but um, creating a comprehensive community-wide response, having this data will help us to do that. Um, we are also noticing, um, Ms. Davis mentioned that the Vermont State Police is seeing an uptick in um, anti-Asian hate. We are seeing that here in Rutland County, as well as um, targeted um, hate toward Hispanic and African-American folks. Um, it has gone up I've probably fielded more complaints in the last month than I did um, you know, January and February and March combined. So it is problematic. And we are hearing, um, and we have this horrible video um, where somebody targeted Hispanic folks with uh, New York plates um, in Rutland County. They are spouting bad statistics. We don't want that to be a thing here. Um, so again, that, that becomes really critical to the work that we're doing to keep Vermonters um, safe and healthy. Uh, a second thing that we wanna see is healthcare provider reporting uh, raw data, data and percentages. So what that means is we wanna know which counties um, are doing a good job reporting race and ethnic data so that we can see where the problems are. Because maybe it's a matter of um, educating healthcare providers on how do you ask this question when it's something that, you know, in the 90s, you didn't ask about race, that whole colorblind thing was really popular, right? So it might be a matter of that. It might be a matter of um, some other issue within the healthcare system that needs to be examined. And we as, um, as folks in the community want to see that information too, so that we can encourage our healthcare providers to comply with Department of Health um, or um, protocols and procedures. Um, I'm trying to go back and forth between looking at you and looking at my notes. This Zoom. Oh, you can you can look at your notes. We're <laughs> all fine with that. We're fine with that. Fantastic. Um, so, like I said, and and that came came from my colleague um, Stefan um, in Wyndham, is that we need to know who isn't doing this so that we can touch base with them and ensure that they have the supports that they need. So it's not just um, DOH mandated, but they understand that their community wants it as well. 
The other thing that we support is the creation of a demogra demographic data responsiveness team um, within the Department of Health. Um, we see that comprising, um, obviously, the statistics team, the epidemiology team, um, I think I got that right, uh, Susana, the executive director of racial equity, and then community members, particularly advocates from different groups, not just racial demographic groups. We are concerned, particularly because no one has a single issue life. We have people who are disabled <coughs> in the brown and, and, and black communities. We have people who are queer. We want to know how this is playing out across uh, demographics. And we want to understand then um, the issues that the Department of Health has in data release and come up with um, a way to release data that suffices or uh, satisfies not just HIPAA compliance, because people are more than HIPAA, and HIPAA, FERPA, and the education system, as, as advocates, one of the things we hear a lot is we can't release that data because the numbers are so small. Um, I'm telling you, in Vermont, we are never going to get over our race issues until, or our other you know, issues of demographics, until we stop um, using that as a shield. Um, and again, like I said, HIPAA is a great thing in a lot of ways, and it does protect patients. So does FERPA. And in a state like Vermont, we have to have a more difficult conversation than other states where concerns about um, patient recognition and identification um, is, is one of those things that, that comes up. And my, um, my suggestion, our suggestion, is that we create a demographic data responsiveness team. Um, I sit on the Vermont State Police's Fair and Impartial Policing Committee, and sometimes we have these hard conversations about Ooh, if we do this, is this going to be a problem? And to have the buy-in from community um, can be really critical for the Department of Health and feeling comfortable moving forward and knowing that they are being racially responsible in what they do. The other thing that we support is increased resources to the Department of Health. One of the things we're hearing is that we just don't have the people power, the, the time um, to be able to um, collect this data or oversee um, demographic data in a cohesive way. So we support what, it, what are the funds that you need to make that happen? What are, the, what are the, some of the other resources that we can provide from the community perspective to make those things happen? So those are the four things that we really support is the increased resources to the Department of Health. Um, we need to understand what they are in order to support that. The creation of, de of a demographic data responsiveness team, um, healthcare provider reporting, raw data, data and percentages, both statewide um, and um, at a county, level breakdown in terms of which providers are reporting um, consistently and which ones aren't. And then the big one, which is the state and county level racial breakdown of who's getting tested, who's infected, who's recovering, and who's dying. Um, so like I said, it's, it's pretty easy in Vermont for us to see diversity and equity as pet projects rather than as an integral part of the work. One of the things that I'm hearing anecdotally in the NAACP is a concern that um, healthcare providers and hospitals who were previously um, tackling issues of um, equity, diversity, equity, inclusion, I'll just say DEI from here on out, um, that they were start, that that was a big part of what they were doing in their facilities, that they've backed off of doing that now. Um, and it's been because of, we're dealing with the pandemic. Well, the pandemic is racial <laughs> too. And we need to understand that as well. So whatever we can do to support those sorts of things or whatever you as legislators can do, as the legislature can do to help the Department of Health to be able to continue to in, support that work um, is really important. The other thing is, is I know that many of you sit on other committees. I've seen you in different places. Uh, and I know that folks are really concerned about the COVID-19 cleanup, not just from a health perspective, but economic. <clears throat> Um, Vermont's population, I was just looking at the preliminary data um, from the census, we're continuing to decline. We know that people of color, we want to get out of those housing dense places. We want to get into places like Vermont where the air is cleaner. Economically, there could, there's a potential here for a benefit with a comprehensive healthcare response. People of color, we are great at using Google to find information and we are doing it as we look for places to live. And what we want to see when we look at places like Vermont is that Vermont had a comprehensive racial, um, racially responsible um, healthcare response. And even though we have tiny numbers, it was really important. So this testimony um, in and of itself is really critical. So I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here today. I know I speak really quickly. So if you want me to repeat anything, I'm happy to do that. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field those as well. Thank you very much. It was, it was actually very clear and um, your um, 
comments about supporting the Department of Health and its efforts, I think are, are very important and how we, how we walk that tightrope between HIPAA and um, transparency is also um, critically important. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, questions, uh, let's, let's take one or two quick questions if you have any committee folks. All right, I don't see hands. I, I see a hand, Lucy Rogers, um, and make sure you unmute yourself. Uh, thank you for the testimony. I just was wondering, um, Director Davis mentioned the problem with uh, our race data that is not self-reported, that's instead perceived. I'm wondering if you have a perspective on whether it's more helpful to have race data that's perceived or to just simply not have that data at all? In other words, would it be a more helpful protocol to say, never write down perceived race data, only write down race data that's that's been self-identified or is it still better than nothing? I was just wondering if you could shed some light on that. Um, well, I think either one is dangerous, right? Um, not having any data at all, at least tells us what's going on, right? So I'd rather have pure data. I think of it like a blood sample. You know, do you test a contaminated sample and, you know, go based on that? Um, from my perspective, there is no excuse as to why we are not getting this data. Now, if the patient refuses, there should be a place for people to be able to say patient refuses. But they're, like, we collect information about height, weight, sex. Um, this should be just as standard as those sorts of things in, re in relationship to the pandemic. Does I, did I answer you at all? <laughs> that answers it. I guess I'm, I'm left okay. still curious as to why it would be so difficult to put in a protocol that that race data is always right. collected and entirely self-identified, but maybe that's a question better left for the Department of Health. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I share your um, befuddlement. I don't know why that, that wouldn't be standard. Although I do know historically the relationship between marginalized uh, groups and um, healthcare is not a good one. So we are reticent to provide that data unless people can tell us how it will be used, how it will benefit us and, um, you know, what, what, are the, what is going to be done to protect me? So it, it really is a comprehensive um, ask that is, you know, may not be as difficult as, you know, eye color, hair color. Okay. Thank you. That was a good question. And uh, maybe we'll circle around. I think it's a question not just for Department of Health, but also for providers when they uh, either perform the inventory themselves or ask patients to self-report on their medical um, profile. Okay, any other um, questions? Thank you, Tabitha. Um, I think we're gonna switch order and we'll go to uh, Mark Hughes uh, first and then we'll move, uh, he's the, uh, Executive Director of Justice for All and then Amanda, you've been very gracious in allowing for us to, to put you uh, after Mark. So thank you for that. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just uh, want to give a special shout out to um, the chair as well as my um, Senator Ingram. I'm here in Chittenden County, so I have to say that, you know. Um, all, to all of the committee, I am Mark well, You Hughes. don't have to say it, but it really sounds, it, it's, it's appreciated. It. I, I, there's <laughs> to y'all I got up there. Uh, and then of course, the, uh, Representative Chena is over there as well. Uh, so I just want to just give a shout out to all of you and, and just uh, thank you first for the, all of the hard work. Again, Mark Hughes, Executive Director of Justice for All. I've been watching um, very closely the activities of the legislature in the dark week, as I refer to it as the dark week historically. Uh, as well as that, you know, that, uh, you know, all the way up to that bridge that led over to this historic uh, opportunity for you to be able to vote as a full chamber or Senate chamber remotely. So congratulations on all of the work that you've accomplished. And also thank you for the work that you've accomplished thus far, keeping our government afloat. So thank you very much. Um, as a racial justice um, advocate, oh, I would note also, I am also the, uh, the, um, the committee chair or the um, steering committee chair of the um, the uh, racial um, racial justice alliance. Uh, we we have a, a people of color uh, 
uh, steering committee here. In fact, we'll be meeting tonight. We'll be talking about this uh, meeting as well. Um, just so you know, the angle that we approach this from is a, an angle of th that, uh, as we've approached all things from, is, is a, with a prism of racial justice through a prism of addressing um, uh, racial equity, inclusion, and in diversity uh, in across uh, state uh, government systems, and more specifically, mitigating systemic racism. That's the work that we've been doing up until now over the last five years. It has been a, as a result of the work that we have done that the uh, racial um, disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel was created. Uh, Representative Lippert, we stand on some of your shoulders, uh, some of the work that you guys folks, you folks have done here. Um, that panel is still uh, in full swing. The work continues and from that panel, a work off, an offshoot of that work uh, happened. Uh, some of that in, included uh, work surrounding uh, the the human rights uh, the attorney generals and the human rights commission's task force which i'll talk a little bit more about here in the future um i think that what's important to note with that task force is um again this focus on uh, addressing uh disparities across all systems of state government that's housing education employment health services access as well as economic development it was a result as the output of that work that we we went further and i want to thank uh uh, Senator Ingram for the work in, in putting these these bills forward, uh, but with Act 9, uh, the the Racial Equity Executive Director, uh, that's Act 9 Special Session 2018, as well as the Racial Equity uh, Panel, uh, which exists, and you just heard from the Executive Director of Racial Equity, um, and I think uh, I can't I would not um, I don't think anybody here would disagree that that wasn't a good idea to bring her in, uh, so I think. Um, that kind of establishes where we're coming from. Let me tell you a little bit about that report. Um, I just wanted, what, first, before I say anything, I wanna qualify one thing. We're talking about racial equity. We're talking about systemic racism, okay? We're talking about all of these things that pre-existed COVID. This is a very difficult conversation to come in and have a, this limited discussion because you, bet, you best believe what I'm doing is, is I'm, we're having these conversations in GovOps, we're having in Senate, we're having these conversations in, in judiciary, in house, we're having these conversations in judiciary, in Senate, in, uh, in, institu in institutions, in corrections, in house. Um, so I have, I have been all over uh, the legislature having these conversations and it's, it's quite challenging from a position that I'm in because the, the structure of our government is not conducive for us to address this as an issue, a COVID uh, 19, you know, uh, what is the relationship between COVID-19 and racial justice and or systemic racism? It is massive. It is a beast. And I don't have time uh, to tell you how many ways in which it is impacting us. Um, and it is unfortunate that, you know, I have to keep repeating myself, but then I have to fine tune what it is that I'm saying to tailor it to that specific committee's particular mission. Uh, so we will talk a little bit about healthcare, but know and understand uh, when we're talking about high impact, high discretion decisions, high impact, high discretion decisions that anybody is making across the state that impacts the lives of black and brown folks across this state, I can guarantee you, we will always be talking about data collection. We will always be talking about training and that is systemic racism training. We will always be talking about policy uh, that is uh, that is uh, equity and inclusion policy. Um, we'll always be talking about impact analysis. That is racial impact analysis, uh, existing and emerging policies. And we'll always be talking about the appointment, the promotion, as well as the um, hiring processes across this state. That is a global conversation, okay? And as, as sure as I'm sitting here, all of those other aforementioned uh, elements we've yet to discuss in your committee. And the only thing we're talking about today is health, high impact, high discretion decisions in light of a COVID crisis. And the only thing we're talking about within that is just data collection, okay? So just to be very clear about these, the scope of what it is that we're talking about, it is a monster. And it is indeed affecting you know a number of folks um, and at, highly um, uh, 
uh, disparate rates, uh, adversely, uh, in adversely disparate rates of uh, black folks across the United States, we are contracting this virus and we're dying. That is the tip of the iceberg. Just as a little side note, <clears throat> I had a little conversation with TJ Donovan just yesterday. And we're, you know, we're talking about, because there's also an intersection of poverty. There's also an intersection of, of class that we have to talk about. Why? Well, why would you not if the average median wealth of an African-American family is one thirteenth that of the average white family? Why would we not be having that conversation? So yes, here in Decker Towers, there's an outbreak. Uh, here in, in Burlington, there's there's stuff going on there, but what's going on with public safety? Why do we have folks posted up at Madam the Chair? There's there's not of a um there's not a um Representative Smith is trying to get your attention, Madam. Well, yes, he has a question, and I'm I'm wondering, do you mind if you're interrupted uh, for questions while you're giving your testimony? Well, I'm I'm going to defer to the chair. All right. Um, so I think that Brian, uh, Representative Smith has his hand up. Let's let's listen to his question. And then I think for the most part, we'd like to hold questions till the end. But um, well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll I, do this one now. Go ahead. I apologize for uh, uh, asking this question, but I th we, we seem to be straying from COVID-19 here. And uh, I think COVID-19 is the issue. Am I correct? <clears throat> Madam, if I might be allowed. Go, go ahead. Um, COVID-19 is exactly the issue, uh, Representative Smith, and that's why I'm here. And, and what I'm here to tell you is, is this is the same thing I hear from every committee. We seem to be straying from COVID-19. The, the facts are is, is that COVID-19 has exacerbated every issue that African-Americans are struggling with as a result of systemic racism. And I'm here to talk to you about one of them. So COVID-19, were it not for COVID-19, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So respectfully, Representative, this conversation is all about COVID-19. Well, everyone is struggling from it. <clears throat> Agreed. But we're talking about disproportionate rates. And if, with, with your permission, if we can, as the chair had indicated, defer these questions till the end of this testimony, I'd be happy to, to speak further to those disproportionate rates directly to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and as you're talking about disproportionate rates, um, as we heard from Susanna Davis, our data in this state is incomplete. Uh, so, but you are looking at, and I think we're all very much aware of the disproportionality of effect uh, across the country. So um, I think that's what we're hearing. So Mark, go ahead. So again, I, I just, I'll just go just for, just for, um, a um a little bit of effect just to just to share with you some of the things that we've done previously and i think this is where the rubber meets the road because i want to talk about what we've been doing here that report that human Re the uh, attorney general's human rights commission's report uh that was released uh by then chair um karen richards and uh, uh, david sure i just want to quote a couple of, a couple parts of that report uh covering housing education employment health services access uh, as well as uh, the economic development. This is what it says. It says, quote, if the state of Vermont is truly committed to addressing the racial disparities that exist in the criminal justice system and other state systems, it must undertake a system-wide analysis of the ways in which the state government actively and passively contributes to these disparities, collect data to determine our baseline and set goals for reducing those disparities across all agencies in areas of of service, including recruitment, hiring, promotion, and retention of employees of color, culturally and, ethnic, and eth eth ethnically appropriate service provision in education systems that provide culturally appropriate curriculum and address uh, racial and socioeconomic disparities in exclusionary discipline, uh, as well as uh, harassment and bullying. So it goes on to say that nothing short of a comprehensive data-driven approach will alter the landscape for Vermont's of color and indigenous uh, folks. It's saying here that a small, you know, as a small state, Vermont has a unique ability to tackle and address these issues in a comprehensive and coordinated way. Now, there's a segment of this report that was devoted to healthcare. Now, this is a report that acknowledges uh, almost about two years ago that we're struggling with challenges in all systems of state government as it pertains to racial disparities. <clears throat> In this area where it speaks of healthcare, it says, while there was evidence in 2010 indicating that people of color have lower rates of access to healthcare, including insurance, 
a, a personal doctor or lack of money to pay for health care, uh, the issue of health disparities goes well beyond issues of access. People of color also uh, experience higher rates of diabetes, asthma, and obesity. Health risk factors, smoking, lack of exercise, poor nutrition are all much higher among people of color. And, and, it, and it goes on, and I'll just skip over this last part in the interest of time, but it says, um, these Vermonters are four times more likely to report poor health in, in, uh, or fair health compared to Vermonters who did not experience physical symptoms. And the reason why I wanted to, to kind of breeze over part of this report is, is just to indicate, and I think it's importantly, we've already started doing some of this work. We've already decided uh, that, you know, we have racial disparities across the entire system. We've already indicated that it was important because what we did is, is we hired ourselves a racial equity director. Those five categories that I named regarding data collection and training and policy and pick that impact analysis are a, comp a component of her um, areas of responsibility. She didn't go into detail on those. <clears throat> and we've already indicated through this report, though we haven't gone back and revisited, that data collection is very important. So, so yeah, I think uh, you know, some of the work that we're doing here uh, aligns with some of the challenges that we're having and why, as uh, Tabitha said a little while ago, we're not already collecting the data is befuddling. In fact, it's kind of troubling that you know, in, in most systems of state government, we keep having to have this conversation. Why would you not, why would we not as a state in areas where we understand there to be high impact, high discretion decisions being made on folks' outcomes, that we, why would we not be collecting that data? So I want to close with just basically saying um, there's other work to do. And, and I think that, you know, yes, this is, you know, we, we need to do some stuff right now to, to address what we're doing regarding COVID. But I think prior to this COVID conversation, uh, clearly we had, already, we had already identified the fact that there were some things that we could do better. And I think as, as we begin to address policy, because that's really the, the, you know, the whole point of this data collection is, you know, targeted outreach, policy, measurement, and so forth. As we begin to, to continue to do this work, you know, I, I'm thinking that some of the work that we're doing, I think we should have an eye on where we come from so we don't return to the status quo. Uh, so uh, I saw a few hands go up. I had more, but I'm going to stop because I, I know that, that, uh, that Amanda's behind me. Uh, and I, I can come, and back, come back and talk to you. I think you kind of got the sense of what it is I'm trying to tell you. Uh, there's more. Um, so if there's any questions direct, uh, directly from me, Representative Smith, or anybody else, I'm glad to take those. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mark. I think that you have hit on a, a key issue and that is while we're discussing COVID-19 and, and making sure that we have the right input data for that specific, for the pandemic and it is an emergency situation that we don't forget the need for ongoing data and information so that we can make systemic change. I think and that's I, right, Madam Chair. I think yeah, that's I, right. we get that. And I think that Susanna's comments were very helpful in that area, as are yours. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, questions for Mark? I don't see a hand. I, I hope I'm looking at all the screen. Let me just check my other screen. Anyone? I'm just going to suggest that we move on to hear from Amanda, and then uh, maybe there'll be questions directed right. to any number of our witnesses so that we can hear, hear the other witnesses. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, so Amanda um, Garces of um, the Human Rights Commission, thank you, Amanda, for being patient. And we have, we have, um, we probably could take more than nine minutes for your testimony. Uh, we might go past 12 o'clock. If, if other folks have meetings, uh, I'm, uh, I do apologize for that, but we've had a lot of good testimony this morning. So Amanda, thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you everybody for having me. Um, I will try to be brief as I also took some stuff out of my testimony. Um, for the record, my name is Amanda Garces. I am the Director of Policy and Education for the Human Rights Commission. Um, I do have an accent, so if anybody has, uh, wants me to speak slow, just say the word. Um, I, I have to say that all the time, just in case, because I am Colombian and I speak fast. So, um, 
So as you know, the mission of the Human Rights Commission is to promote full and civil and human rights in Vermont. Uh, we enforce the laws over which, has, uh, over which we have jurisdiction through investigations, conciliations, and litigations. Um, through COVID-19, we have uh, had a lot of concerns regarding uh, the um, Asian American uh, backlash that is happening right now in this state. In March, we submitted a we submitted a press release um, to inform communities that we are here. Uh, we also have an incident report, and we've started to um, have some come in. And I really encourage. Um, everyone to share that incident report so that we have some data on what is happening in our state and that we can also support the communities. On March 9th, on April 9th, we submitted a let letter to the Department of Health, the commissioner, and um, I submitted it for the record, so it's there. Um, and it was about data collection and uh, why we need it. Um, Everybody else has spoke about the disproportionate impacts that is having that COVID-19 is having in African American populations. Latinos in New York have the highest rate, uh, the highest de de death rate. So we want to be able to see what is happening. We also want to extend that race data. Uh, it's a call that is happening nationwide to also include language. Um, and um, let me just scroll through my notes so that okay. um, is a uh, language in addition to the race and ethnicity data that we are seeing that there are issues with language access and so that is data that people are asking for experts have asked to extend that data to gender identity sexual orientation uh, and disability status we know that there is uh, this proportionate care that happens within these populations and we want to be able to support. In Vermont, we are concerned about our farm worker population as well and the access that they have. We know that um, testing is free, but the treatment is not. And for undocumented population, uh, we are trying to see like what can the state do there's fewer resources since the open doors clinic have closed. There's some fear uh, that is happening nationwide by the undocumented population, but also by all immigrant workers. So that is something that we want to start thinking about how this is affecting mm -hmm. um, our farm workers and documented or not, and, and how that can be supported. Um, so I, I, cut a lot of my testimony. The other two parts on equity issues that we want to make sure that we're bringing to the table is what is happening with our disability communities and how data is also really important in this situation because how we respond, um, it's, it's crucial as well as people with psychiatric disabilities who rely um, and support of family members and friends who may be denied access to the facilities that they are going through. So I think that um, here at the Human Rights Commission, we are looking at you know, the vast majority of the protected uh, uh, categories that we have and like how this is impacting them. Um, and to add to the language barrier also ASL, is like a, a key issue. We are seeing that a lot of the communities are not receiving a lot of information. Uh, a group in Burlington created a website with um, some of the information is in all the different languages, which is really powerful and important for people to be able to hear what is happening in their language. But I think as a state, we need to do more. And I think um, related to this crisis and being able to really respond with language, with ASL, and uh, understanding our marginalized uh, population, so that you know, like we respond um, as as a state with love and support, and that we're thinking about them. Thank you. I think uh, that you've raised again. I think raised some issues that while there we've heard some very compelling testimony, for example, on disabilities and what happens when kids with disabilities are at home with their parents and need the medical or other care um, 
and, and how that is covered, how we pay for it. Uh, what we're hearing is uh, a need going forward that we need to look at that systemically going forward. So it, there, there are some common themes I think that we can pull out of this. Uh, and the, cer the certainly the Senate Health and Welfare Committee has taken testimony on the disability issue, but it is really difficult to resolve that, not just during an emergency, but um, outside of the emergency. How much do we value uh, the people who need the care that um, they, may, they may not be getting? So, Amanda, thank you for the, your testimony. Are there questions for Amanda? Let me make sure I'm, yes. Ah, represent it. Representative Christensen, a, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Amanda. Um, thank you for being here. And um, you said there was an uptick in Asian American incidents. And we've read about, I think, one or two in the newspapers. How prominent is that? And then I have another question. Yeah, we just, we just started our, our collection um, only a week ago, and we've only had a few, but the the um, but we've collected from like the hearsay. This happened to my friend. This happened to my friend in communities, which is why we uh, decided to do the incident reporting. So that is happening, and it's happening in you know in a small level of children just not you know hearing there was um, families that are just walking on the street and and, and being harassed. There was one incident, this, this was not an incident reported that I just heard from someone uh, who uh, was walking into the store and then they started telling you brought the virus. And so those things are happening that we need as a state need to be able to respond really strong that it is not, that that, that is not acceptable and that is not how we relate to our communities. And my other question is about translators in the hospital in healthcare settings. How prominent is that, or how um, how bad is it that we don't have translators? I I know that um, is is very difficult um, at the Human Rights Commission. So we've had some cases, um, and although I cannot speak to anything in specific. Um, because everything is confidential, uh, but I, I can say that, you know, and, and as a person who, whose language is the, is, uh, who's, who came to this country not knowing the language and then learned it and had to translate for families, I know that it is really hard. Uh, nationwide is really hard. There's call for just volunteers to be calling in. There's uh, the issues that are compounded right now is that a lot of the translation services in Vermont that also telecommuted, which is very difficult. And some of the people that are hired through that might not have the medical language. So if, if I was to translate with, about a disease that I don't know anything about is really hard because then you're losing a lot of that information. So I think we have to do better at really getting qualified translators and interpreters that understand the medical language to be able to translate that information. And, um, and you know, I, I could probably get other people to come and testify on that specific thing of what is happening on the ground right now. But I do know uh, there was an article on ProPublica regarding the impact on, on language barriers in even in normal times. So this is just like triple in. Okay, thank you. Yes, th thank you. Um, I think that um, the language barriers uh, uh, you're speaking about um, the use of the Spanish language, of course, are a number of our migrant workers are in that category, and we probably should pay attention to their health care needs a little bit. And I think Representative Lippert is next. Yes, well, let me pick up on that and say that since we're reaching the end of our time here this morning, uh, uh, Senator Lyons and I have discussed this. Neither of us have, have made a firm agenda for next week. We're both going to be doing some planning to, later today. Uh, but uh, one of the issues that I hope our committee, perhaps our joint committee, uh, will look at is access to health care for our uh, migrant workers, documented and undocumented. We've been doing some uh, research in the background to better understand uh, what the limitations are or are not. And uh, I think it's important for us to, to look at that both in the 
context of COVID-19 and more broadly. And then secondly, also the issue of uh, disabilities. Uh, our committee uh, has not had the opportunity to take the same kind of testimony mm -hmm. perhaps that the Senate has, but I know there are additional uh, disability access issues during COVID-19, uh, specifically around uh, persons with intellectual uh, challenges and uh, psychiatric disabilities and having someone be able to be with them as they are seeking treatment or being hospitalized even. And uh, again, I hope that uh, either as our committee separately or jointly that we look uh, further at those issues in the, in the next uh, several weeks. Uh, you know, uh, what uh, we, we can talk offline about that, Bill, but I think our committee has taken significant testimony. It might be that what we've heard uh, can be made available to you either through the YouTube recording or some of the testimony that we've received. So we can talk about that. Um, Brian China, Representative China has a question. Yes, I think it's mostly for Amanda. Okay. Um, so the question is uh, in Massachusetts, uh, I heard that they were able to expand their state's emergency Medicaid for migrant workers. Um, do you know about this? And do you have any thoughts about um, how that might, we might apply something like that in Vermont? Yes, and I know, I don't, don't know much. I was reading about it that uh, too. And I, I think Migrant Justice is also doing some extensive research on that. So I would encourage um, it, the committee to invite them to speak um, on that. Um, and we can probably get some other experts to talk about it. So, but I think that's a great idea. And it's, it's also happening in New York and Oregon, I believe. That, that is something that uh, Representative Lippert and I uh, have been looking at with uh, Ledge Council. We will Council. take testimony. Yeah, so we will take testimony on that. Thank, good question, Brian. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda. Um, Representative Rogers. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I was just wondering from your perspective, it seems like there is progress being made on the collection of self-reported race data. And I'm wondering if you think it would be helpful to have the legislature address it, this issue in bill form to kind of more formalize the expectations, um, or if you think that sufficient steps are being taken without having a formalized expectation and build form? I think that um, Susana spoke a little bit about the, the conversation that she's had with the Department of Health. I think that there is a really good intent to collect the data and I, 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 um, I, I would defer to Susana in the conversation that she's had uh, with the Department of Health for that question. And I really appreciate um, like that, you know, there hasn't been any pushback. So I think that, I, th I think for us to come as a collective to really, you know, ask for what we want to see on the ground so that we can support and respond as a state is really important. And I think the commissioner and the leadership is really hearing uh, what, you know, what we are saying. So I don't think it's necessary, but that's just my personal opinion. Okay. And I mean, we've heard compelling testimony from uh, a number uh, from everyone today about the importance of not just looking at this during the pandemic, but uh, going forward and understanding that what we're seeing during the pandemic might represent um, systemic uh, needs, need for systemic change. Um, I've got another request here. Oh. Okay, there's a dialogue going on that I can I will ignore for the time meeting. Sorry. Uh, any other questions? All right. Seeing Madam no Chair? other questions. Yes. Is there? This is Susanna Davis again. Please. I just wanted, I just wanted to jump in um, on the topic of upstream factors and the relatedness of COVID nineteen response to other issues. I appreciate Representative Smith's question slash comment about uh, how close do we, how, how narrowly do we focus on the issue of COVID-19? It's a fair question. And one thing that I did not mention when I said that I worked for the New York City Health Department was what I did there. I was their director of health and housing strategic initiatives. And one of the 
biggest parts of my job was explaining to people why the health department gives a damn about housing. And oftentimes I would cite statistics that said, well, the average uh, emergency department visit costs $5,500. That's 5,000 for an ambulance and 500 for the actual ED visit. And when we talk about uh, marginalized, low-income and vulnerable people needing emergency and acute healthcare, it costs far less to stably house them and stave off a lot of the triggering factors that lead to acute and chronic conditions than it does to routinely treat them. So I, 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 I say this to encourage the committees to think about potential creative points of collaboration with your colleagues and other committees and other parts of the legislature. For example, um, your focus as a health committee is not just on responding to ongoing public health concerns, but also on prevention. And so thinking about things like housing and all of the barriers to adequate and affordable housing that exist absolutely has the downstream um, in, impact that's gonna help us mitigate things like a COVID-19 or looking at the way the, you know, job creation and economic stability, which is absolutely impacting people who are not able to work right now during the pandemic. So I do encourage, and I've said this in the Senate Committee on Government Operations as well, I do encourage you all to think creatively and think outside the box at ways that you can impact policy that don't appear to have a direct relationship to health, but that absolutely do impact those public health um, events. Uh, thank you for that. And just so you know, you're speaking to the choir. We are all um, we are all on the same page, in the same key, uh, and we we do appreciate that. One of the things that we Unfortunately, with the pandemic, uh, I think it's intruded in the process of hiring a prevention chief at the, in the uh, Office of Administration, uh, which is something that we've all worked very hard um, to, to have happen and to get, to continue the work. I think that all of us agree um, that you pointed out needs to be done. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We, we appreciate that. I think I have another hand up. Let me see. Uh, Representative Chena, did you have your hand up again? Yeah. Um, All right, go ahead. Well, just this will be the last one unless there's another compelling question. Okay. And All it's right. sort of like a question to all, all of us on the, on our committees, um, maybe more than the, um, advocates and, 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 uh, public servants and people speaking with us today, um, which is, I'm hoping that we can dig into this more. Like, uh, can we maybe check back in with our witnesses in a week, in a couple of weeks? I'm a little concerned that about the pattern in, in government or in, in systems where people talk about an issue once and then they check the box and they say, we took our testimony on racial and ethnic disparities. We did that. Um, and I think part of what came up in the testimony and I think what Mark, Mark's point was that the current crisis is amplifying and magnifying, and I guess it was in many of our witnesses' testimony, that the current crisis is magnifying the existing disparities and the existing problems that are, that are built into our system. And so when we talk about the emergency response, you know, if, if our emergency response is all we do, then are we just gonna go back to the way things were when this is over, or are we gonna learn from this and do something differently after? And so I guess my question is, can we please check back in with the witnesses in a, in a couple of weeks, may, it might take some time, but check back in with them to see how things are going and to see what recommendations you all might have um, I, besides data collection, other actions you might need us to take. Okay, thanks, Brian. I think that does summarize uh, the issue for us and, and ensuring that uh, we look at systemic issues going forward, not simply those related with COVID-19, but right now, the data collection seems to be an imperative if we're going to understand the effect um, within our racial and ethnic minorities in our state. Uh, so, um, but we, I think there isn't one, of, I don't think anyone wants to forget um, the systemic issues that we're facing. So thank you. All right, other, no other quick question. Uh, Representative Lippert, last couple of words. Well, I, I guess I just, given our time, uh, 
and David Englander spoke briefly earlier, but I, I, I appreciate the Department of Health uh, through David being here and hearing the testimony, even if we're not hearing, going to have time to have David speak at any length today. I think that was, I think it's very important uh, that the Department of Health uh, be responsive and has been responsive in many ways, but we understand there's always, there's, there's definitely more to do. And uh, I, again, thank you for being here, David. I, I'm, uh, Senator Lyons, I'm not quite sure how to proceed at this point since we've gone past our time. Uh, well, here's my suggestion. I'm going to turn to David. Um, I know that you've been listening in. I think our goal might be to have you come back at some yeah, point I think, to I think, that, I think when we when we I, I would suggest yeah. that when we follow up perhaps uh in a few weeks because I do think uh, we should also follow up as a representative Chena suggested I mean this is a this is a this is a long-term issue this is not something we'll resolve in a few weeks by any stretch but in terms of the specifics around data collection uh and the COVID-19 I think we should come back to this and uh we should invite uh the Department of Health uh as well as some of our witnesses to help see where that we've progressed. We'll do that. But uh, David, I want to turn to you and um, ask you about your being available to bring us up to date on, on some of what the Department of Health is doing. I know that Susanna talked a little bit about it, but um, your comments. Well, so again, my name is David Engler. I'm the Senior Policy and Legal Advisor with the Commissioner of Health. I'm delighted to be with you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of in our in with how much time would you like me to take, Madam Chair? I could do it in a minute if you'd like. I could issue a series of declarative statements. That would be helpful. Um, why don't uh, listen? Why don't you go ahead and do that? We still have a critical mass here. Okay. And and then we will um, we will look to invite you back as more data is collected and as this whole process matures. Sure. So. Um, it's been incredibly helpful both to read the letters from various folks as well as hear the testimony. Um, I, I'll say this, that we were collecting information from the Department of Health uh, and we were collecting it inconsistently. Uh, as of last week, we're now collecting it consistently. Our expectation is that ethnic graphic data is gonna be collected 100% of the time. That information has now been posted or I should say it's available on a daily update starting yesterday. We expect it will be um, available every day on our public dashboard as of Friday. Um, we're committed to marshalling the resources necessary to go back and get the, the, the unknown data from the 420 um, individuals from whom we don't have data. Um, that will take marshalling some resources with the assistance of the administration at large and our brothers and sisters and other agencies. Um, the uh, work I can commit that we'll have any conversations with regard to additional data that could or should be required in order to have a more comprehensive understanding of what's happening on the ground. Um, I, uh, uh, Director Davis spoke eloquently and, and with more perspicacity than I could um, about the issue and about the kind of data that we're, that we're collecting um, and that we, that we can collect. Um, I certainly agree that, um, that HIPAA, the federal the federal and state privacy laws can be too blunt an instrument um, uh, in terms of uh, it doesn't allow us to see information that would be that would give us a view into what's happening on the ground, and you know we'd be happy to have a conversation about the way that that can either be um, the the way that we can collect that information in a way that also is, is respectful of people's privacy and, and the law. Good, uh, you know, uh, as you're as you're talking about that, I think we probably can think of some possible creative ways to do that. So thank you. We will, we will have you back um, at some point. Back. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ann Donahue, are you back? Uh, did, you had a question a long time ago, or was it uh, that you were leaving? I don't know. Uh, uh, hello. No, I, um, I did have a question. I think it, it, it can wait. It was a broader issue about um, the question of self-identified um, versus yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, but I'm, I've been listening in because my internet failed, so just on uh, the phone. That's, that's such an unusual problem. <laughs> yeah. All right. right. Thank you. Um, we, will, we will continue with this topic and um, try, to, uh, try to reassure folks that we are doing something going, moving forward. Thank you all. It's been a real pleasure 
and we'll see each other tomorrow morning at 9.30. So take care. 9.30, good. Thank you.